way to wake you up is to talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That'll wake you up. A lot of excitement on that one. The second coming of Jesus Christ. It's pretty obvious from that wording what it means. It means Jesus Christ will come a second time. In his second coming, it consists of two phases. One is called the rapture. That's when uh, you and I, we don't have to face death, and we can automatically just be caught up in heaven with God, and then the bodies of our fellow saved loved ones will, all, will be resurrected and automatically caught up together with us in heaven. The, fe the second phase of that second coming is what we call the second advent or Armageddon. And then the second advent or Armageddon is when Jesus Christ, he actually comes down upon this earth and then conquers the armies of this world and sets up his, uh, sets up his millennial kingdom. So when we talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ, many times we would be focusing on that second phase, which is his second advent or otherwise known as Armageddon. So we will be talking about that this morning it is his second advent. Now, the second advent, believe it or not, for some of you who didn't know, it has a path. Now, what do I mean by it has a path? What that means is when Jesus Christ comes down on this earth, he just doesn't come straight down and that's it. As a matter of fact, when he comes down on this earth, he's going to be riding along a certain route or a path. As he uh, goes down on a certain path, then he'll be conquering the armies of this world and then finally land at his landing spot. It's kind of like an airplane. When you see an airplane uh, fly upwards and downwards, it goes down a certain route, right? It doesn't just go straight down like that. Otherwise, you know, we'd all die. <laughs> so... The Lord Jesus Christ, it's kind of like an airplane. He's going to come down like a plane going, around, going along a certain route or path and then finally make his final landing spot. Now, in order to explain all this, let's look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Because this is Sunday Bible study, we will be covering a lot of scriptures today. We'll be covering a lot of scriptures today. All right, Matthew chapter 24, and then we'll read verse 30. I assume it's up to 1030, 1020 to 1030, right? 1040, oh, okay. okay then. All right, all night long, bless God. All right, let's do it. It works spiritual. All right, let's, let's put that to the test. All right, so Matthew chapter 24, and we'll read verse 30. Now, there are three passages. Uh, we're going to look at multiple passages sometimes, so I want you to have bookmarks, pens, or whatever ready, or you have five fingers for a reason, so you can do that too. All right, we're going to look at uh, chapter 26 as well, chapter 26. Then we're going to go to Mark chapter 13, Mark chapter 13. So again, Matthew 24, Matthew 26. And then it's Mark chapter 13, Mark chapter 13, and finally, it'll be Mark 14. So if you can't go to Mark 14, that's fine. It's the very next page, and we'll come there eventually, okay? All right, so we're going to go to Mark 13, Matthew 26, and Matthew 24. All right, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. You will notice right here when Jesus Christ comes down, he doesn't come down through the clouds. He comes in the clouds. That's the first thing to note. So that shows right here he's not just coming straight down like that. He's coming in the clouds. So it's as if it's still hovering midair. That's why Jesus Christ is kind of like a plane. It's still hovering midair, so to speak. It doesn't like just go through like that. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30. The Bible says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. 
And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Notice he's riding along the clouds, it shows. We're also going to look at chapter 26, verse 64. Chapter 26, verse 64. The last part of that verse reads, Hereafter shall he see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in in the clouds of heaven. Let's look at Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13 and verse 26. Because you already have those things bookmarked, I'm going to read them immediately, okay? Mark 13, 26. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Chapter 14. Chapter 14. <clears throat> and verse 62. And Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see, at verse 62, 62, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Okay, so there's a lot of verses here. So first things first, we know that Jesus Christ, when he comes down, he's riding along the clouds. He's in. He's in the clouds. He's not going through it like that. So that's incorrect. He's going in the clouds. So then he's like riding along the clouds. He's hovering midair. It shows that it's not going straight down like that. That it's because he's going to be in the clouds, he's going to be hovering midair. Hence it shows a certain path. Now that we know Jesus Christ, he's going to be riding in the clouds, and he has to go along a certain path, how does this path work? How does it operate? Well, that's the reason why I drew out a map, and today's teaching will be covering the path of the second advent. That'll be today's uh, title, the path of the second advent. So let's look at this path and see how it operates and works. First of all, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 19 and Joel 2. There are two passages, two passages, Revelation 19. Revelation 19, the second place to be Joel chapter 2, Joel chapter 2. These are the two main passages that people will refer to when talking about the second advent talking about Armageddon. Revelation 19 and Joel 2, they cover an army of people, of saints, who follow alongside Jesus Christ as he comes down upon this earth and they are following behind him as Jesus Christ conquers his army. So the introductory passage that shows you everything about the second advent is Joel 2 and Revelation 19. For some of you who don't know about this, I need scriptural proof for what you're talking about. Yeah, that's very true. We can make stuff up when we preach on a pulpit, but it's another thing where we're preaching about a subject that has scriptural proof. So you have to make sure that this kind of subject, this topic is real, is biblical, scriptural, not because it sounds Christian. Because that's why a lot of people go for the hocus pocus stuff on purgatory and Jesus Christ transforms himself into literal flesh when you eat the cookie. I mean, people go along that because it sounds Christian. You might as well say Jesus did a saber war with Darth Vader and people will nod their heads and believe it. But how can you distinguish and find out what's true and false? One is supported by the Bible. Another one is completely come up out of thin air, and it's completely fiction. So you have to look at the scriptures. Second Advent sounds nice and everything, but you have to have scriptural proof. So Revelation 19 tells you the scriptural proof. It tells you the story. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Capital faithful and true. See capital letters there? So that's God. That's God. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. So notice he is coming down to make war. 
out of heaven. He's coming down. Hence it shows second coming. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. All right, that's plainly God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Notice right here that when Jesus comes down out of heaven, he has a bunch of armies following along with him, riding along white horses, riding on white horses. And they're clothed in white linen. Notice they're making war with the people on the earth. Verse 15, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with the rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Notice he conquers the armies, and he's going to rule over them. So it shows he is setting up a rulership on the earth. Verse 16, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. God is truly going to be a king, or the king, excuse me, the king over all the kings of the earth. All right, Joel 2, Joel 2. <clears throat> now you get nowadays in Hollywood where they try to depict uh, super comic book heroes about people who can uh, just put, uh, shoot out laser from their eyes, shoot out some kind of energy balls from their hands, or they can run along the walls like a like Matrix or something like that, or they can fly across the heavens, do you not realize that what they're getting from is from the Bible? Here's a bigger one. Don't you realize that those heroes that you're fantasizing about is actually you? Don't be a loser dressing up in some kind of costume, going to Comic-Con in San Diego or other events. Don't be a poor, sad loser like that. You are really going to be one yourself. You might say, really? You need scripture. Yeah, read your Bible, Joel 2. Here we go. Notice right here in Joel chapter 2. The Bible says at verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Verse 3, A fire devour, devoureth before them. Okay, so it's a plural group of people. And whatever is going on with this group of people, there's a fire coming out of them. And behind them a flame burneth. So they leave a trail of fire. That's something. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Isn't that interesting? So what, is the, uh, what are the armies that go along horses that come out of nowhere? Revelation 19, right? I mean, this never happened during uh, Joel's time period. There's only one other time period you can find in the entire Bible. That's Revelation 19. So that's why we know Joel 2 is talking about Revelation 19. <clears throat> Notice verse 5, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Okay, that is like a supernatural army. That's, not, that's no regular army. You ever seen a horse jumping on top of a mountain? <laughs> like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Ah, it's armies, matching Revelation 19's wording. Before their face, the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall, look at this, climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. That's Superman. No weapon is going to hurt their bodies. Verse 9, they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. That's matrix. Where, where do they get all that ideas from? <clears throat> and they shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord, here's the key, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his what? 
army. Okay, that, there's no doubt that's Revelation 19. That's Revelation 19. God and his army coming down out of heaven and then shaking up the whole earth. That is definitely Revelation 19. For his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? No one, no one, because you got this uh, army of supermen coming down. So that's fascinating, isn't it, about the second advent? You didn't realize that before, did you? When you come down, you're, uh, this is the fiction, this is the story about Superman coming down like this, but you got to realize that's you. <laughs> that's you. So when you come down, that's why there's a song that goes, uh, when we come down, that we're going to be flying like Superman. <laughs> There's a song that does that. All right. We're also going to look at Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. And then your second hand to go to Genesis 1. Genesis 1. Habakkuk 3. And then also we're going to look at Genesis chapter 1. All right, let's explain the path. First things first, we, I already gave you the introduction that there is such a thing called the second advent. That's what I laid out. Secondly, I did explain that who's going to be participating in the second advent, God's going to be coming down, and you are that army of supermen. That's fascinating. But remember this, in order to start this map, we're already up in heaven, right? If we are up in heaven then it's not going to start a, a path coming out of the clouds. That's not how it starts. We have to come out of heaven. That's where it starts. If we come out of heaven first, then think about this. We have to go through what is called the sea of glass. You have to go through the sea of glass first in order for you to fly across the galaxies and the universe and then ride along the clouds as you go along the path of this earth. Now you might go, sea of glass, what is sea of glass? I'm glad that you asked, so we're going to look at these passages right here. Didn't you know that uh, out in outer space over there, some t in the universe, that on the edge of the galaxies and the universe, there's a huge body of water, and that's not even science fiction, that's not even question. Scientists have discovered that. They said beyond the far outreaches of the galaxies and the universe, they say that there's a huge body of water. So that's no question in our minds. And as you go uh, out in the edge of space more and more, it gets more cold when you get further away from the sun, right? So hence, it can explain the frozen sea. But that all sounds nice and dandy. We need scripture to prove that, right? So let's look at some passages here. First of all, go to Habakkuk chapter 3, and then I'll explain right here why. I'll explain why there is a sea of glass. As a matter of fact, Genesis 1 already told you there is a sea of glass. You just didn't notice it. <laughs> All right, first things first, back at chapter 3, and then we'll look at verse 3. The Bible reads here, God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise, and his brightness was as light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was hiding there the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at his feet. Now notice that the wording right here matches really well about the second advent. If you looked at the previous verses, we mentioned that uh, Jesus Christ, he's coming down in brightness, correct? And then uh, we read at Re Revelation 19, Joel 2, he's coming down with fire, Right? So notice right here when it says God is coming, I mean Habakkuk 3 verse 3 started out God came, right? So when God is coming, and then notice the wording right here, brightness and fiery, you can automatically 
figure out that this is talking about the second advent then. But let's keep reading, and then you'll notice it more and more. Uh, look at verse 6, verse 6. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations. That's very plain there. So he's conquering the nations, the armies of this earth. Why, that never happened yet in the Bible. He didn't conquer all the world yet. There's only one time period, the second advent, when he comes down. So this is clearly the second advent. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. Well, obviously, the world did not shake up yet. Uh, the mountains scattered and everything. So this is all second advent. There's no doubt about that. Understanding that, look at verse 15. Here's the key. 15 says, Thou didst walk through the sea. But notice, with what? Thine horses. That never happened. When did God come down with an army walking through the sea? So that's second advent. But notice he's walking through the sea. Well, it's just a regular sea. It's probably the Dead Sea. No, it, because it says, through the heap of great waters. He's, you see that through? You see that word through? Did you notice that? So he's not just, uh, okay, if we're talking about the sea on the earth, it doesn't make sense. What's he going to do? Come down out of and when he lands on the earth, just goes underneath the ocean. That don't make sense. He's going through a body of water when he's coming down on the earth. So it won't make sense if it's talking about this sea over here. What other sea? There's only one, Genesis 1. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And then we'll look at verse 6, Genesis chapter 1, verse 6. The Bible will tell you. Now, isn't it great to be at a Bible-believing church? If you're at a Bible-believing church, what happens is, one, you believe every word, every word in the King James Bible to be perfect. Secondly, you have a right system of rightly dividing, dispensationalism. Dispensational, dispensationalism is known to be a system to take things, histor uh, historical grammatical context. Basically, it takes words literally. When you do that, it opens up the doors to a lot of deep doctrines you never thought of before. All right. Welcome to a Bible-believing church. Stick around. Keep on coming, all right? Keep on coming, all right? All right, Genesis chapter 1, and then we'll read verse 6. The Bible says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the water from the waters. Okay, did you see that right there? When God creates a firmament, he's putting this firmament, uh, I'll draw it out, that way you can understand, in the midst, the middle of the waters, okay? All right, that way I can make things easier. Let's call this uh, water number two. And water number one. Now, look at the verse and see if this matches. So, pretend there is no water one and two. Pretend it's all just water, okay? If it was all just water, the Bible says, put a firmament in the midst. That means in the middle of the waters, right? So, that means it'll look like this. That's why... It splits the waters. It says divide the waters from the waters. Isn't that what the verse says? So then that's why water one, water two, it's splitting the water and the firmament in the middle. Okay, can we agree so far? If we agree so far, let's just keep reading. Notice right here, verse 7, and God made the firmament and divided the waters. Look at that picture. It matches with the wording. Divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Isn't that true? Right? Waters under the firmament, waters above the firmament. So this makes sense. What's this firmament then, right? Look at this. We're going to look at verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years 
and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Oh, there's your universe right here. There's your space right here. See, I told you so then. If this is referring to outer space over here, then it makes a lot of sense that what I told you before and what the scientists have talked about is true, that there's a large body of water at the edge of outer space there. So if the firmament is the middle, the waters above is the one on top of space, and then the waters below is referring to our seas over here, which is shown already at verse 9. Look at verse 9. And God said, let the waters, what? Under the heaven. Okay, firmament is also called heaven if you look at verse 8. See? So the water under the firmament, water under the heaven, be gather, uh, verse 9, be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. I told you so. So this is the water underneath. So this makes a lot of sense. So then this is the water that you're going through. It's on the edge of outer space. You're going through that. But if you still don't believe me, there's one more. Uh, go to Revelation 4. This will be the last one, Revelation 4. I have a separate teaching on this, so I'm not going to get too much into this. Uh, I title, uh, the title of it was Deeps in Outer Space. So I gave a teaching on that one in one of my uh, videos in my YouTube channel. So I'm not going to really expound that one. That's a separate teaching. But I'll give you just enough to believe, all right? Like Revelation chapter 4. There is a sea on the floor of heaven itself. See, there is a sea on the floor of heaven. Look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. And before the throne, that's the throne of heaven, there was a what? Sea of glass like unto crystal in the midst of the throne and round about the throne. See, told you so. So there is water above uh, the universe over there. Okay, let's go, uh, let's go to Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. Establishing the verses, we now know, okay, so the beginning stage is, bam, we go through that sea of glass. We go through that sea of glass. And then traveling through outer space, we come down, riding in the clouds. Now look at that map, all right? Let's begin, shall we? Let's begin the journey. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2. This is a song of praise from the Jews. The Bible says, And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Okay, some people might assume that Moses, this is talking about when Moses met God at Mount Sinai. There could be some application there, but this does not make sense. Because notice it says he came down with what? Ten thousands of saints. Why, that didn't happen. That didn't happen at the book uh, during uh, Moses' time at Mount Sinai. When does the Lord come down with ten thousands of saints? We already know that second advent. But if you want proof, look at Jude 14. Jude. Notice what Jude says. Jude points out this is some time at the future. This is long after Moses. And Jude is talking about this. Jude 14 and 15. Jude 14 and 15. Notice that Jude is talking about the coming of the Lord. See? See? That's talking about the second coming of God. Look at Jude 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Notice it's to conquer the world. Verse 15, to execute judgment upon all 
and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Why, that's un clearly the second advent right there. That's clearly the second advent. So what Moses, if we go back to Deuteronomy 33, what Moses is talking about at verse 2 of chapter 33 that when God comes down at the second advent, he's going to start at Mount Sinai. You notice that? He's going to start from Mount Sinai. Hence, we start right here. So that's where God's going to start his landing. And remember, he's not going through the clouds. He's in the clouds. So then he comes down here, and then he's hovering on the clouds. He didn't go his landing spot yet. Remember, it's kind of like a plane going down, right? So think along that. So it's Mount Sinai. Notice that the verse talks about Paran and Seir, right? At Deuteronomy 33, verse 2 that we read. So then that's why this makes sense. He's going this way then. That's why the dotted line goes this way. So he's heading toward this way. Now let's keep reading. The next passage is uh, Judges chapter 5. Judges chapter 5, verse 4. Judges chapter 5, verse 4. As a matter of fact, when I went to school at Berkeley, uh, believe it or not, they had a Bible class. I couldn't resist. I had to take a Bible class at Berkeley. So I took a Bible class at Berkeley. But the Jewish professor there, he's not saved and he's totally liberal. Uh, what a bad combination, right? So nothing, nothing worse in ideology than a liberal Jew who doesn't believe in God. But uh, this professor, he even, told, uh, he even explained in the Bible class that when people give songs of praise, it's not just, you know, just praising God, but that it's actually divine oracles. It's prophesying. And I was like, some liberal professors have better sense than some Christians nowadays. They just think, oh, it's a song of praise. There's nothing prophetic about that. No. It's not just an ordinary song of praise. It contains prophecy. It contains prophecy. So uh, when Moses gave a song at Deuteronomy 33, we have to realize it was a prophecy. It's not just simply talking about some past event. But think along those lines when Deborah is singing at Judges as well, all right? Judges chapter 5, and then we'll read verse 4. The Bible reads, Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. The clouds also dropped water. Notice verse 5. The mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. Now, notice right here that the Lord, he never came out of Seir and Edom, right? I mean, another thing is, notice that the mountains didn't melt and the clouds dropped water, earth trembled. There wasn't anything catastrophic on the earth. That never happened yet, unless they're prophesying, unless it matches with Deuteronomy 33, that song about the Lord coming out of Sinai and Seir. What do you think would make more sense? It makes more sense that this is matching with Deuteronomy 33, that they're both singing about the same and prophesying about the same thing. So we see right here at Judges chapter 5 that uh, he's coming out of Seir and Edom. So we already established Seir from Deuteronomy 33. Uh, Deborah, is, when she's singing that song along with the Israelites, they also added another one. They said Edom, okay? So Edom is along that direction as well. So let me write down Edom. Edom is like a little bit above. So it's going along this path. So we're, we're going to keep going up. That's the idea. That's why we pass Ezion Geber. There's no doubt about that. So we're going to pass along Ezion Geber. It keeps going up this way. How far up it goes? Well, as we continue on with the map, then we can guess. First of all, go to Isaiah 63, Isaiah chapter 63. And then we'll look at verse 1, Isaiah chapter 63. Then we'll read verse 1. 
Now, do you remember Revelation 19? It says that Jesus Christ, that he's going to stamp out and blood will fill up the garments. All right, Revelation 19, you might remember that, right? Now, notice Isaiah is talking about that same thing about Jesus Christ trampling the armies and blood staining his garments. So Isaiah is prophesying about the same thing. Look at Isaiah chapter 63. And then uh, we'll read verse 1. The Bible reads, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. See, God is talking about himself. So this is God that's coming out of Edom with dyed garments coming out of Basra. He's great in his appearance. Look at verse 2. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Do you remember Revelation 19? It said he's treading on the winepress of the wrath of God. Do you remember that? So that's the same thing. Uh, keep reading verse 3. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Well, that's no doubt. Second advent then. Jesus Christ conquering his armies. But what direction at verse 1? Who is this that cometh from where? Edom. From where? Basra. So we just keep going up. So Basra's right here and Edom's right there. So this is the right direction. Okay, next passage we will turn to is Jeremiah 48. Jeremiah 48. And then I want you to go to 2 Thessalonians 1. 2 Thessalonians 1. Jeremiah chapter 48. And then I want your second hand to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. His next uh, target of location he's going to be passing by is Heshbon. Heshbon. So you'll notice in that map there, Heshbon, the location. And it's around the region of Moab. It's around the region of Moab. And the particular city is Heshbon. All right, Jeremiah chapter 48, and we'll start out at verse 43. 43. The Bible reads, Fear and the pit and the snare shall be upon thee, O inhabitant of Moab, saith the Lord. Okay, God's saying that judgment's going to come to you, Moab. 44. He that fleeth from the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that getteth up out of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For I will bring upon it even upon Moab, but notice right here, the year of their what? Visitation, saith the Lord. God's going to pay them a personal visit himself. I mean, our visitation today is no harm, no danger, no bloodshed. We knock on their doors, give them the gospel. That's grace. You don't want God to come down on your visitation. When he comes knocking, he's not just going to be knocking. He's going to kick down the door. And there's going to be bloodshed. Why? Because you rejected his grace. Right now, he's giving you that chance. And that knock ain't going to go on forever. Seek ye the Lord while you may be found. Amen? Okay, let's keep reading. They that, uh, they that fled stood under the shadow of where? Heshbon. Because of the force. But a what? Fire shall come forth out of Heshbon, and a flame from the midst of Sihon, and shall devour the corner of Moab, and the crown of the head of the tumultuous ones. Notice right here, this is latter days at verse 47. See that? Latter days. That's sometime in the future, God says, in the tribulation. See, so there's no doubt this is talking about Jesus Christ coming down at Armageddon after the timeline of the tribulation. So this is Second Advent stuff. There's no doubt about that, especially when it talks about when he's visiting them, when he's coming down to them. He's coming down with fire. Boy, we looked at too many passages. That's the Second Advent. He's coming down with fire. But another proof is, well, let's look at Second Thessalonians 1. So keep your hand here, though. Okay, keep your hand at Jeremiah 48, sorry. Go to Second Thessalonians 1. 
and verse 7. Verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Okay, that's pretty plain. That's Jesus Christ at his second advent, right? It's coming down out of heaven. Verse 8, in flaming fire. See that? Flaming fire. That's clearly matching with Jeremiah 48 then. Taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is clearly talking about the second advent of Jesus Christ. It's coming down in flaming fire. And if it's coming out of Heshbon, then this map is correct. Notice that in the map, uh, Dibon is included. Dibon is included. We're going to look at verse 18. Verse 18. Let me see. Did I throw Dibon? I don't think I did. Oh, no, I did. Okay, so notice that it's on the region of Moab here. And that Heshbon I mentioned, so it's going to have to go through Dibon as well. So Dibon, Heshbon, the territory of Moab. Hence, when we're going toward this direction, we have to go a little bit up this way. It has to kind of a little bit turn around this way. So this is correct. Uh, let's look at verse 18. The Bible mentions at Jeremiah 48, 18. Thou daughter that dost inhabit Dibon. Come down from thy glory and sit in thirst, for the spoiler of Moab shall come upon thee, and he shall destroy thy strongholds. So notice that when God spoils and ruins Moab, he's also going to visit and include Dibon as well. So this map is correct. Let's also look at Numbers 21. Numbers 21. Now, did you notice what I put in between there? You'll notice in between... I covered the verses of Basra and Edom, correct? And then you'll also notice in the map, I'm covering Heshbon, Dibon. Okay, then what does, what does the king of kings and lord of lords have to go through then? Did you notice that? From here to here, he has to go through a certain place. The king has to go through a certain place. A place what is known as the king's highway, actually, at the book of Numbers. So the book of Numbers, it talks about the Jews conquering this terrain, and it's called the king's highway. But isn't it funny, isn't it a coincidence that in the map, if the king of kings and the lord of lords is going from Basra to Dibon, he has to go through this location called the king's highway. King's highway? What in the world? Look at Numbers chapter 21. We'll look at verse 22. This is Moses and the Jews going along this terrain called the King's Highway. Let me pass through thy land. We will not turn into the fields or into the vineyards. Or we will not drink of the waters of the well. But we will go along by the King's Highway until we be past thy borders. So the Bible calls it the King's Highway. But man, ain't it a coincidence when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords go along his path, his route, his highway, that he's like, you know, I'm going to pass through this territory called the King's Highway. It's just appropriate. Strange, man. That's something, isn't it? That's so cool. All right, let's look at Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. And then I also want you to go to uh, several more places. We're going to look at uh, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1. So Zechariah 14, Acts chapter 1. And then the last passage to be Habakkuk 3 again. Habakkuk chapter 3 again. We're going to look at Acts chapter 1, Habakkuk chapter 3. And then also... Uh, Zechariah chapter 14, Zechariah chapter 14. Now notice it shows his landing spot. It shows his landing spot here. Okay, where is he going to land, Pastor? He's going to land at Jerusalem. But along the way, he's actually going to uh, land on the Mount of Olives, and then he's going to make his final spot. Uh, spot Jerusalem. <laughs> Look at this. This is pretty cool, all right? 
Because, uh, God just comes down on this mount. Why? He wants to make a stop on this mount, not as his final resting place, but to just split the mountain in half. <laughs> he wants to just split the Mount of Olives in half. I mean, didn't we read the passages about the second advent? The mountains have to tremble. So God's going to literally do that. He's going to step on the mountain, the Mount of Olives, and split it in half. So let's look at the passages. Zechariah chapter 14, and we'll read verse 3. The Bible reads here, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. Okay, that's plain. That's the second advent, right? He's conquering his armies. Verse 4, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. His feet's going to land there which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the mount, look at this, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. It's saying right here that when he steps on the Mount of Olives, it's going to split in half, one toward east direction, one toward west direction. Man, that's something. I never read that in the Bible. Well, why didn't you? <laughs> read your Bibles. Read your Bibles. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. One's going to go south, one's going to go north. Half of it split. Man, that's something. Look at Acts 1. Acts 1. That shouldn't be a surprise. The, the shining ones told the apostles that, actually. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, that's Jesus, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as he's seen him go into heaven. They're saying that Jesus Christ is going to come down just like when he went up to heaven. He's going to come down, boom, like that. And they were in the mount that time, actually. They were on top of a mount that time. All right, uh, let's look at Habakkuk 3. Habakkuk 3, verse 6 and 8. 6 and 8. The Bible says in verse 6, He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations. We already read that. That's Armageddon. But look at this. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. Another one is verse 8. But it's not just mountains. It's also rivers. Verse 8. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea? That thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Notice right here that it's also including the rivers. So the mount and the rivers. Notice this path then, if the Mount of Olives is right here, so you see Jericho. So around Jericho and Jerusalem, that's where the Mount of Olives is located. So he has to pass, isn't that interesting? He has to pass the river, the Jordan River here. There's something significant why Jesus wanted to be baptized in the Jordan River. There's something significant when Elijah comes down in the tribulation... Before he got raptured up to heaven in the book of Kings, he had to go through the Jordan River. There's something significant about the Jordan River. So many interesting stuff. That's where Joshua, where he had to pass through the Jordan to enter the promised land. Joshua pictured Jesus Christ about Jehovah saves, God saves. Jesus, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And Jesus Christ has to go through the Jordan River to enter the promised land. There's so many pictures here. There's way too many Bible pictures here that matches with the second advent. There's something significant about the Jordan River. So Jesus Christ, he's going to have to come through the Jordan River, and then he's going to have to also uh, land on the Mount of Olives because that's where that location is. He has to go around from Heshbon, Dibon, and then if Mount of Olives is right toward this direction, and then Jerusalem, his final stop, he has to cross it. He has to cross it. 
Okay, here's a, another passage. We're going to look at Zechariah chapter 8 and Ezekiel 44. Uh, three passages, final three, and we're done. Zechariah 8, Zechariah 8. The second one to be Ezekiel 44, Ezekiel 44. The last one, John 20, John 20. Again, Zechariah chapter 8, Zechariah 8, Ezekiel 44, Ezekiel 44, and John chapter 20, John chapter 20. I'm making good timing. All right, here we go. Let's wrap this thing up and make it a good closing. His final stop is at Jerusalem. Why? Because he made a promise to the Jews thousands of years ago. He said that I'm going to uh, take over this kingdom, the Jews. I don't care what people said about you. I don't care if the news media puts you at a negative light or United Nations that they're gathering together against you. I don't care what onliners talk about that you Jews are the ones who run the world and take over everything. I don't care if the Antichrist does come out of your lineage and betray you and you get persecuted. I don't care if the devil himself or will be like the second Hitler through the Antichrist and wipe you all out with another Holocaust. I don't care what they say. I made a promise to you, and I will come back again and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and I will rule over this kingdom. He made a promise. Look at Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 22. The Bible says, Yea, many people and strong, Nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in where? Jerusalem. Oh, isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? It doesn't matter how you feel or about the Jews or their nation or all that. All the nations around the world, they're going to gather together and worship God in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. So we can see right here, if God's going to reign and live in Jerusalem, that is his final stop. That's his final stop. They're going to pray before the Lord there at Jerusalem. They're all going to gather together. That never happened yet. This only applies. This will only make sense if he comes down on the earth, right? And, rule, and rules as king on the earth. That fits well with second advent. All right, verse 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Man, you talk about nations groveling. What happened to United Nations? Let's all share an equal amount. No, God don't do that. He said, my nation. And he picked a nation, and that's the nation of Israel. Uh, let's look at Ezekiel 44. Ezekiel 44. So then how is he going to come to Jerusalem? This is cool. <laughs> Look at verse 1. Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh toward the east. And it was what? Shut. Now, if you know about the eastern gate at Jerusalem, it shut because the Muslims cemented it shut and placed a graveyard out front of it. But if you keep reading it, the Bible says at verse 2, Thus then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be open, and no man shall enter in by it. So God even prophesied that. The eastern gate will be shut and closed. No one will go through it. Why? Because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince the prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate and shall go out by the way of the same. Notice right here that it's because it's reserved for God himself, Jesus Christ. So that eastern gate's going to be cemented shut, always closed, but it doesn't matter uh, what you put in front of it or the Muslims do with that and block it all. No. God's going to go ram right through it. That verse says, it's so cool. He says he's going to enter by the way of the porch of that gate and go out by the way of the same. How are you going to do that when it's cemented shut right now? 
Not a problem for the Lord. He's going to go through it like a wall, like he, he did that before. Look at John 20. John 20. He did that before. John chapter 20, verse 26. You can shut it, but you ain't going to stop him going through it. John 20, verse 26. The Bible says, and after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst. Man, he phased right through it. Isn't that, uh, we read at Joel 2 about those walls, those buildings. We're just going to sneak in all of a sudden like that. Wow, that's going to be incredible. So imagine you're that army coming alongside Jesus, and here's that eastern gate. Uh, don't we have to put on the brakes, Lord? No, it's okay. Uh, we're going to ram right through it. No, it's okay. We go through it. And then Christ sits down upon his throne, kicks out the Antichrist from his seat, and reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords. So let's close it off like this, okay? Summary, with everything we looked at, this is how it's going to go. These verses teach that the Lord will come down out of heaven with his supermen saints through the waters above outer space, then crossing the nebulas and galaxies, coming down midair at Mount Sinai, going alongside Seir, up to Basra, along Edom, as they go through the king's highway. Turn onto the north of the Dead Sea at Heshbon, through the Jordan River, where he was baptized before, through Jericho, split the Mount of Olives in half, go back on his white horse again, and then burst through the closed eastern gates and sit on the throne of Jerusalem, ruling over all the world as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now that's the path of the second.